extensions. Three things. We're going to start by discussing what extensions are, then I'm going to tell you a bit about what types of extensions there are, and then I'm going to tell you how to write and deliver an extension. So let's start with a quick recap of British parliamentary debating. You have four teams, two opening teams and two closing teams, two teams on Gov, two teams on Op, and those teams are given an order from first to fourth, and judges will actively compare each of those teams against each of the other teams in the debate in order to try and assess who gets all of the points, who doesn't get any points because they came last. You have points of information. So, what is an extension? An extension is any new material delivered by a closing team. And this material can be anything. It can be a new analysis, new impacting, new argumentation, framing, rebuttal, anything that you think is valuable and is likely to make your team in the debate stand out and look like they're the best team in the debate. Teams can also have multiple extensions. Uh, and often, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, it's quite a good idea to do so. And the reasoning behind that is uh, if one of your extensions gets taken out, you at least have some other things to rely upon. So what then is the role of each of the speakers in the back half? The member is the first speaker on either closing team, and their job is to, very simply, deliver the extension. The whip, who's the second speaker, has two jobs. Their first, and I would make the claim most important job, is to defend and rebuild the extension. So often the other team will attack your extension and you have to spend some time responding to the rebuttal to your extension, keeping it alive. And then they want to rebut the other bench. Now, crucially, two things to note here. The first is that the whip can't add extension material. So you really need to make sure your member is delivering that extension as well as possible, as succinctly as possible, because whilst the whip can uh, elaborate upon those things, it can't bring new material in. The other thing to note is that often whips, when they're doing rebuttal, will prioritize attacking the other team's extension. And that's pretty uh, simple. The reason for that is there's no one else in the debate who will really attack that extension. And if you don't attack the extension, it's going to stand a lot more clearly and powerfully at the end of the debate. There are two rules to be aware of when you're writing your extension. The first, and definitely the most important, is what I want to call the derivative rule. And that is that closing teams do not get credit for repeating claims made at their opening. And this seems quite intuitive, right? If your opening makes a big argument about why this fixes racism, and you make another argument about why it fixes racism, well, they're going to get a lot more credit for that most of the time. I've also put here as a note, you also don't want to be reliant on your opening team. So let's say you're closing government, an opening government spends a lot of time proving why the environment gets a lot better. If you at closing government spend a lot of time proving why that's really important and good and why the environment being better is nice, you probably can't beat your opening team. And the reason for that is your analysis relies on their analysis. You've proven why the thing that they've proven is good, but you haven't proven anything beyond that. You rely on their analysis. The second rule is the inconsistency rule. And that is that closing teams should not contradict their opening team. And this applies most of the time, but I think there's two exceptions. The first is if your opening team does something absolutely crazy and you think it's made the debate unwinnable. And where that happens, you can do what we like to call knifing. And this is where you just directly contradict your opening team. You want to do this very in very few instances, because if you're not doing it fairly, then you're ruining the debate and you actually might be penalized for doing so. I'm going to give you an example of that in a second. The other example of the inconsistency rule is you can sometimes skirt around it. So you might make the claim at closing, our opening thought that X would happen. We think that's possible, but we think that Y is more likely to happen. And there you're sort of suggesting that maybe your opening was a little bit wrong, but you're sort of suggesting something else is more likely. And that's a softer form of contradiction that most judges will let you get away with. The most important thing to note here is never try and rebut your opening team. Never, ever do that. 
because that is definitely trying to contradict them. You can say that what they've said isn't as important as the things you're saying, but you can't really say that the things they said were wrong. So let's look at examples of both of these rules in practice. The first uh, thing we're going to look at is the topic that we should make vegetarianism compulsory. And let's say opening government suggests that this will be better for animals as they're treated poorly during meat production. If closing government then suggests that animal cruelty will stop now, those two claims are very, very similar and arguably the same claim. So unless closing government could bring a lot of new things in, they would likely do quite poorly in the debate. But let's take the same debate but look at the opposing bench. Let's say in that debate, the deputy leader of opposition, uh, the second speaker of opening opposition, makes a throwaway comment at seven minutes in their speech, and they say something like, oh, there'll be a lot of backlash to this policy. Closing opposition can still run an extension about backlash. And the reason for that is that opening opposition haven't properly established that there would be backlash or that the backlash would be bad or have harms. So the idea here is it's only when an opening team sufficiently proves something that then you can't take that thing. But if they just say uh, a headline or they very, very briefly discuss something, then it's still fair game for you to provide an extension on that. But maybe you want to be careful when you do so. Let's look at that second rule, uh, the inconsistency rule. Let's take the topic that we should legalize the use of torture. If opening go government models that they would implement torture as a punishment for every single crime, even things like, you know, driving offenses, I think it's fair for closing government there to say, okay, well, look, that is just an unwinnable gov case. We're going to do something a lot more reasonable. And we, if you were a closing government member, you might start your speech with that and just quickly point out why it was that you had to knife them. But if we take a second debate, let's take the debate that we should impose a tax on fast food. If opening government models that the tax would be 10%, and you might be sitting there as closing government thinking, oh, it would be way better at 50%, you're not allowed to change it. So you can only change things that your opening did and only directly contradict them if they've actually made your side unwinnable. It's a very, very harsh test, and I would usually err on the side of not contradicting them at all if possible. So that means we have this dynamic between the opening and closing halves where both get sort of advantages. The advantage of the opening half is they have first dibs, yeah? So they can sort of look at all the material in the debate and, and try and cover all of the things they think are the most important. And closing in exchange for that gets these two other advantages. The first advantage they get is time. So they get all of the opening half to prepare their speeches. They get a lot more time to prepare the things they want to say. And the other advantage they get is the last word. So they get to come after the opening half. They get to respond to all of those claims and position the things they are saying against them. Whereas opening half often can feel a bit powerless. They've made their claims and now they're just sort of Oh, out of the debate a little bit, except for points of information. So now let's turn and look at actually what sort of things we can do with our extensions. And broadly speaking, there are three main types of extension. The first and the most common is what I would call a widening extension. And this is where you take the debate into a whole new area and you make a new argument, you provide a new frame to the debate, anything that's new. The second sort of extension is what I would call a deepening extension. And this is where you take an argument that was made at your opening and you add new analysis. You need to be careful when you do these sorts of extensions. They're also often called analysis extensions. You need to be careful because if you're not doing well, then it might very much look like what you're doing is derivative. The other problem you can run into with these sorts of extensions is that you might not actually be helping your team win. So let's say opening government spent a bit of time proving that this policy would be good for the economy. And let's say they gave five really good reasons for it. If your extension is just giving another six reasons why it benefits the economy, that's probably not that helpful in the debate because opening government have already done a very good job already establishing that. 
So you haven't helped the government bench very much. You've helped them win something they were already winning. So these are very valuable and they are useful, but be careful when you use them. The third sort of uh, main type of extension are responsive extensions. And this is where you actively rebut claims that have been made by the other two teams. These are still extensions. Uh, I think some judges who are not perhaps as adept with BP debating will think that this is just rebuttal, it's something different. That's not the case. Uh, you getting rid of other teams' analysis is valuable to your bench and should be credited as such. That said, usually you do want to have some other substantive contribution. So like I said before, that often you want multiple parts to your extension, I think that's particularly true if you're running a responsive extension. Uh, otherwise, you will very likely lose to your opening and maybe even other teams in the debate. And let me clarify all of this with uh, an analogy. And this analogy is perhaps a bit childish, but I think does a good job of illustrating the way that this works. Imagine that there is a painting competition on one very, very large canvas. And spoiler, this is an analogy for BP debating. Uh, different teams take it in turns to go and paint on the canvas. So, you know, the prime minister goes first, the leader of the opposition goes second, and so on and so forth. And if you're the government member, or either member really, when it's your turn, you have three options. There's a lot of painting already on the canvas, but the first thing that you could do is you could pick a new area and go and draw something new there. And this is often a really good idea. Opening government missed a patch and you can make a really nice painting there. The second thing you could do is you could find something the, painting, the painter before you drew and you could try and fix it. You could add colour and depth and detail and turn a painting that wasn't very good into a good painting. The problem that you might see there is that the judge might say, oh, well, the, the team before you already sort of made that painting. You just made it a little bit better. So when you do that, you again need to be careful. The final thing you could do is you could go and erase the work of the other painters. And in some respect, that might be very helpful because now your painting definitely would look better by comparison, by contrast, because you've gone and smudged their paintings up quite a lot. But all of the time you've spent making their paintings worse is time you haven't been able to spend making your painting good. And if you went and muddied their, their paintings and came back and didn't have anything good to show, then you might be in a spot of bother. And so this teaches us a few things. The first is it sort of teaches us roughly the way in which these different extensions work. But we can also draw some lessons from this. The first is that as a member of the closing half, you want to be looking actively during the first half and find opportunities. You might say, oh, I really thought they would paint in that corner, but they didn't. That's great. We can paint there now. The second thing to note is that what you end up doing depends a lot on what the other painters are doing or will do. So if the debate is a very, very narrow debate, if there aren't that many issues in it, then you might imagine that that makes the canvas quite small. And when the canvas is smaller, maybe you want to spend more time erasing the work of the other painters. Maybe you want to spend more time doing detail because there isn't, aren't as many new areas to go and draw. So I know that that analogy was perhaps a little bit uh, labored, but hopefully it, it gets across the idea of the way these different extensions work and when and where you want to do them. By and large, I would say for new debaters, try and focus on that first sort of trying to find new areas of the debate and drawing something new there. But don't be afraid to try the other two. Just make sure that when you're doing them, uh, you are doing them as well as you possibly can. And you're confident, particularly with the second sort, the analysis extension, you're confident that you are the team that's properly making that argument. Okay, let's now look at examples of each of these sorts of extensions. Let's start with widening extensions. And I've got three examples here because I think these are the ones which have the most latitude. The other two can be a little bit, I would say, simple. Let's start with uh, the topic that we should implement compulsory vegetarianism. If opening government focused on animal rights, that would be a really good opportunity for closing government to say, well, hold on, uh, vegetarianism is incredibly good for the environment because it weakens the meat industry, which reduces methane, etc., etc., etc. And that might be a really smart thing to do as closing government, because you've got a benefit that helps not just animals, but also humans. 
yeah, by making the environment substantially, substantially better. And so closing government wouldn't say, well, opening government is wrong. This doesn't help animal rights. But what they might say is opening government helped animal rights sometimes. We help animal rights and human rights everywhere in the world by fixing the environment. So as you can see, closing government looked at the whole debate, found an additional benefit, and are able to market that benefit as being very important. Let's take a second example, that women of colour should break away from the feminist movement. And closing opposition in that debate might do what we call a frame. They might focus on a specific area or a specific type of people. And here, they might focus on women of colour in the developing world, and they might make some arguments about why those sorts of women really need assistance and resources from the mainstream feminism movement. And again, they would need to find a way to market that as the most important thing in the debate. And the way you might market that as the most important thing in the debate is to say, these are the women who are the most oppressed, who need the most support, and if we can help them, then we will win the debate, because these are the most important people. The final topic we might look at is uh, for, for widening extensions is the topic that we should break up companies that pose a threat to democracy. An opening government there might focus, naturally, on why breaking up these companies is good, but a clever closing government might bring in a new mechanism, a new way of fixing this problem. And they might say, the threat of being broken up will make these companies regulate themselves. If you're Google or Facebook or, or Twitter, because this new policy is available, you're going to work extra hard to prove to the public that you're not a threat to democracy. And that might be a better way of fixing the problem than just breaking these companies up because that might have a lot of harm to, say, the economy, etc. So there are three different examples of widening extensions. All of them involve taking a little bit more of a lateral view of the debate. Let's now look at an example of a deepening extension. These are, I think, easier to come up with uh, with respect to an example because they are almost always just choosing something that was said at opening half but probably not said quite well enough. So let's take the debate that we regret the belief that apologising is a virtue. And opening opposition might say something like, well, apologising helps you move past things, which is sort of flagging something, but not properly establishing it. And closing opposition might deepen this idea by providing additional substantial substantive reasons why the act of apology itself helps you move past trauma. And you might frame that by saying, look, opening opposition did say that it helps you move past things, but that wasn't good analysis. We're going to give you four additional reasons why this is in fact true. And here are the four reasons uh, that, that I, I got, that it is a positive action that lets you control the narrative, that it positions you as the more moral person, that it's a signal to yourself that you've moved on from the trauma and that it puts pressure on the other party to show that they're worthy of the apology and to make active amends with you. The point simply being here, we've found a weak spot in the opening opposition case. We've been paying attention and found that they actually didn't quite substantiate something properly, and then we've provided the analysis that they were missing. And notably, we didn't just ignore the fact that opening opposition did talk about it a little bit, we foregrounded that and said, look, adjudicator, you're right, they did mention it, but we're the team that's going to properly prove it. Finally, let's look at an example of a responsive extension, that we would prefer a world where people had a homogenous appearance. And if opening government in this debate makes a big argument about why this would decrease discrimination, and you at closing opposition might realise that this is the bedrock of the opening government case and make a very central and concerted effort to claim that it won't decrease discrimination, and you might even try and prove that it makes discrimination worse. Now, notably, this is a good example of, I think, a good and a bad responsive extension. Because if you just tried to prove that it won't decrease discrimination, you're spending all of your time at closing opposition trying to get rid of the government benefit. But let's say opening government made three arguments you might have spent all of your time getting rid of one of them. But then, when you compare both of your contributions to the debate, you have really no argument and, and no benefit, but they've brought two other benefits to the debate. 
And in that instance, you might look not so favorable against them, and they might beat you, even though you've spent a lot of time rebutting them. And that's where this second part of the sentence comes in. You might even make the claim that it makes discrimination even worse. And if you were able to prove that, that would be a really good extension, because it starts with a responsive extension, but you've been able to turn that responsive extension into a widening extension. You've been able to prove that it actually will make the problem worse. And if you've done that, now you've actually brought a very strong substantive contribution to the debate. The reason why you might focus on the responsive extension here is because opening government spends a lot of time trying to substantiate this one big idea. First, remember your extension is the most important thing in the debate and try and actively market it as such. The way you talk about your extension should be to make it sound like you are the team bringing the missing piece of the puzzle. Second, usually try to have at least two extensions, particularly if you're a bit newer to, to debating into BP. And the reasons for this are a fewfold. The first is if you only have one big extension and then uh, opening takes it, you're in a bad spot. The second is if the judge doesn't like one of your extensions and they think it's derivative, at least you have a fallback plan. Uh, and the third is sometimes if you just have one big extension, then it can just get really, really targeted with rebuttal. And that might take it out of the debate. So if you have multiple extensions, at least you have something remaining in the debate if things go a bit bad. The third thing to say is that member, you should try and frame upwards. So acknowledge the things your opening has said and explicitly position why your extension is the most important thing in the debate and more important than your opening's case. And here you want to use language like, yes, opening proved this but we're going to prove the much more important claim of this. So use language that is evocative and position yourself as the team that is doing the more important job. The fourth thing to say is don't stress. There will almost always be something available. 14 minutes in the opening half is not enough to take everything, and there is almost always going to be something that was skimmed over or something that was missed entirely. Should you try and bring up your extensions in POIs in the opening half, or should you try and keep them secret until the member speech? Don't POI your extension almost all of the time. Now, why don't I clarify why that is? Let's imagine you're closing opposition, and you're sitting there with a great extension idea. And the Prime Minister speech starts, and you're rearing to go, and you just say, point of information, what about, and then you talk about your extension. Here's the problem. The Prime Minister thinks and gives some rebuttal, and then the Leader of Opposition gets up, and they get to try and take the argument bef and take it away from you. They spend a lot of time trying to say that thing. And then the Deputy Prime Minister gets up, and they get to do the exact same thing. They get to attack that argument back. And then the Deputy Leader of Opposition gets up and can try and take that argument back again. And by the time you eventually get to give your, your extension at Closing Opposition Member, well, it's not really your extension anymore. So most of the time, I wouldn't POI your extension. I think there's one small exception to this, which is that maybe closing government could POI to DLO, uh, because at that point, there's no additional OG speaker to take that extension away from you. But you want it usually not POI your extension too early, because it sort of gives the game away. The other thing I'd say is often you probably have other better things to POI. You can probably just POI to attack their case and attack the essence of what they are saying. Uh, so that's my general advice. Some people will make the claim, well, maybe that's not fair to opening teams then, because maybe they deserve a right to hear what you're going to say and have a preemptive response to it, to which I say, well, then just make sure that you're taking a POI from the opening team when you're speaking in closing. So if CO is happy to take a POI from OG in response to their extension, that sort of gets over that idea. Two more things. One is to try and think backwards. So often people make the mistake when thinking of extensions to think, oh, here are all the different things that this policy does. But sometimes you actually want to think in the inverse. Think to yourself, what if we could prove it would be the most valuable thing in the debate? So you might make, say to yourself, hmm, is there a way we could prove a mechanism that worked but didn't have any of the harms? That would be super, super valuable. 
And that might lead you to thinking about that extension in the, uh, the Facebook breaking up debate we looked at before. So don't just think from the ground up, also think from the top down. What sort of things would be incredibly powerful if we could prove them and then try and go from there? The final thing to say is all of this extension advice also applies in the inverse to the opening half teams. So if you're the opening half, you should try to scorch the earth where it is practicable. And this is uh, often referred to as backloading, trying to add a lot of material, particularly in your deputy speech, to try and make the job of the member a bit harder. Crucially, when you are doing this, it's not enough to just sort of say headlines. So you can't just sort of say, oh, uh, this is better for the environment and it's going to be better for women. You have to actually and actively prove things to a sufficient standard. So this is the, uh, the last part of the presentation for today. And I just wanted to sort of run you through a process of how you might actually write an extension uh, for people who might not have done one before. First step, celebrate. Closing half is really, really fun. Uh, you get a lot more time. You also get, I think, the benefit of being able to think laterally, which is perhaps more engaging, at least for me, than the opening half. It's a lot less stress than, say, Prime Minister, where you're speaking in 15 minutes. You've got heaps of time. It's a lot of fun. Now to the actual steps. Second step, brainstorm with your partner. Take about five minutes, and you would spend those minutes perhaps silently brainstorming. Write down all of your ideas, even the obvious ones you think your opening will take, because sometimes they don't take them, and then you definitely are going to want to run them. After you've done this, discuss with your partner and share ideas. Write down your partner's ideas so you don't forget them. And after this discussion, you should have two things. The first thing you should do is you should have a little bit of a potential extension list, and you should have an idea of which of them you'd most like to run and which of them, uh, that's our massive fallback plan if we absolutely have to run it. The second thing you should have is an idea for some of the extensions or at least one extension that you think you probably will be able to run and probably want to run. And this you could consider your sort of safe pick. By this point, we should be about seven or eight minutes into prep and we've got seven or eight minutes left. And the way I would divide uh, labor from here is I think the member can start writing their safe extension and maybe even start thinking about how they would write those other extensions. The WIP, meanwhile, should be brainstorming to see if they can think of any new extensions. Have we missed anything? Are there any layers here? Could we perhaps do a, an analysis extension? Thinking about all of the other options they could do. Now, that doesn't mean the WIP isn't helping the member. And I think one thing the member should feel very comfortable doing is just saying if they need help. So, hmm, can we think of any other reasons why this part of the extension is true? And the whip chimes back with, yeah, absolutely, here's a couple. So it's still a collaborative process, but about halfway through the, the, the process, I would sort of split off a little bit. Now we get into stage two. The debate starts. And at this point, both speakers should have a pretty good gauge of what they will ideally run, an idea of your plan, and also what they will fall back to. And as the opening half begins, the member can keep preparing their extension whilst trying to tr track the opening half at least a little bit. You can't just spend the whole time writing your extension. You want to keep one, one ear open, thinking about the ideas that they're going to say. You also should be tracking a little bit and annotating your extension with that. So before, when I talked about framing upwards, you often want to quote the exact things that each team has talked about. However, the whip is definitely doing a lot more of this sort of job. The whip should be focusing on all of the things that they are saying in the opening half and writing them down. And the reasoning for that is that the whip will have to rebut all of that in the future. So the whip should be tracking the entire debate. I would also say as an aside here, usually the whip will probably be doing a little bit more of the points of information duty just because the member has to speak uh, quite, quite early. So often, whoever is speaking later will be more of a focus on those points of information. Now, the next step is that you have to be flexible. Sometimes a new idea for an extension will come to you in the debate. Sometimes you can make a responsive extension out of rebutting one of the other opening team's main premises. Sometimes your opening will just screw up and not run something that's really, really cool, and you get to run it, and you're like, 
really, really excited. If this happens, communicate with the other person and begin writing. There's a lot of communication in the closing half, a lot of checking in, are we still running that, are we not running that, etc. Um, if one of you hears your opening, say something that you were going to run, do two things. The first thing is uh, cross out on your list of extensions that thing that you were going to write. This is quite important. Uh, cross it out probably in a red pen. Oh no, we can't say that thing anymore. Uh, the second thing you should do is you should have a discussion and say, well, does that change our game plan? And sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. There's nothing wrong with having a very active dialogue with the other member of your closing half because you really need to be on the same page. And this is sort of that idea. Sometimes your opening will partially take certain ideas. So we've gone through a few of the examples of that uh, in, this, in this already. They might say the title, they might provide one line of analysis or something of that nature. When that happens, either remove that part from your speech or flag it in a different color pen. Uh, so you might say, OO only gives us one line of an analysis, but we're going to give you three new mechanisms and that's going to make the debate way, way, way more favorable for us. So finally, the member will speak and the whip should be listening at least partially to make sure they're on the same page, to make sure that they can defend the extension as well as possible. Sometimes your member won't explain things quite as well as they wish they had. And it's actually fine if that's the case, as long as the whip is listening and can note, oh, hmm, damn, Marcus didn't explain that thing as well as he could have. I guess I'm going to have to do it now. Then the other team's whip will speak. They'll likely attack your extension quite a lot. Uh, and then we close by having that whip speech. And that's, again, this is a simplified rendition of it, but you're defending your extension and then you're going on the offensive. So that is our lesson today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>